Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Grace Community Chapel. I'm glad you're here this morning. I have a helper. I don't know if you can see him or not. Man, if they made glass cases for your kids, that would just be so convenient, wouldn't it? <laughs> just see you tomorrow. <laughs> you right down there? Okay. Well, why don't we pray real quick, and then we... Uh, have some announcements. We'll go from there. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day we have here today. We thank you for um, 
for the church that you've built here and, and across the world, Lord. We thank you to be a part of that, and we just ask for your blessing on this service, and um, just thank you for loving us and all that you do for us. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right, I'm going to have Cheryl come up for the first announcement, and then uh, uh, we'll come back. At least one of us will. I'm not sure if both of us will, but you ready, bud? Okay, I'm told to be good. <laughs> so I have really exciting news. But first, I have ugly news. And the ugly was me. Yeah. I, I have a confession, and I've repented, really. This isn't a joke. I really, really was mean. I got so overtired. I really said things I shouldn't. I didn't swear or anything like that. <laughs> but I said what I thought, and it wasn't nice the way I said it, to some help. Bill got to see me do that twice, once with my sister and once with that. And that's not me. Um, and it was a, I thought I was hurting my witness. And I just want you all to know that because you're part of the body. And I just want to apologize because I would never want to do that. So that being said, I just, <laughs> I just going on to the good now. Got off the ugly. I was trying to figure out how to do it, but I didn't want to leave with ugly. So I'm going to leave with good because we had one of the best years ever. Yes. Yes. Praise the Lord. If you think of the economy and everything now, who would think that we'd be able to do this? First of all, I have to tell you, Pete made a mistake when he said we want to do 11,930 boxes because he had added a 1,200 one-time donation in memory of um, one of our drop-off leaders last year. So disregard that number and know that we did way more than the 12%. We almost did 14% over. And so what we did was um, on the truck was 8,000. 342 shoeboxes. Yes. And that is awesome. Last year, um, we did, as the church, we did 312 boxes. This year, we did, as the church, 405 boxes. We also did GCAs, most of their stuff, which was 86 boxes. So... Thank you all for your donations of the money, the time, the taking of my wrath, um, all this stuff. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, the drop-off, we were the largest drop-off for the churches around here that, um, in our, our group of the 10, and we collected here. This is why we're all a little tired, whoever helped out. We took in. 2,144 boxes. That means we packed them and we put them on the truck. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I just think it's really exciting. We said we were going to dedicate this year at the beginning, I don't know if you remember, to Bear. And let's give a round of hand. <laughs> so there. So thank you. We did the best we've ever done. Let's keep it up. Pray, pray that these boxes go to the right child. I thank you for the people. You have done way more with the shipping. The, we had 20 volunteers from this church, and I thank you. We just did an awesome job, and praise the Lord. Thanks. Thank you, Cheryl. We'll start collecting for next year. We can do that like next week. Just start collecting your items in the shoeboxes and get a head start on it. Okay? No days off. All right. Uh, next announcement I have is Family Discipleship Night. This month, a question, our catechism question is how many persons are there in God? And yeah, three, right? I'd ask the kids, but they're not listening to me, so that's fine. <clears throat> Talk a lot. Oh. Um, three persons in God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so our memory verse is 2 Corinthians 13, 14. You can look that up if you want to. Um, and then, um, yeah, December, again, we're not having a f like an official family discipleship night, but we are having our church Christmas party on Friday, December 22nd, 6 o'clock here at the church. 
I found somebody to do food for that, to organize it. Christy is going to take that on. So if you want to make a food item, there's a sign-up sheet. Is it posted? Is it out here? It's all, it has Christmas lights on the sign. So you, you'll get joy just from signing up, from looking at the Christmas lights, okay? So that's out there. Um, just bring whatever you want for food. We're going to have food. We're going to have um, some games, a devotional, a look short, or I don't know if it's going to be short or not, but it's going to be a message, and then singing. So it's going to be a really fun Christmas party. You should come. Yes, Lily? Oh, yeah. So I didn't ask the deacons about this in advance, so I don't know if it's set or not, but everybody seems to think they're decorating a deacon now. <laughs> All right, so they, they can say no if they want, but it's fine. Um, but <laughs> So there will be fun no matter what we do, all right? Maybe just pick one deacon to decorate. I don't know. We'll see. We'll draw straws and see which one it is. I don't know. What are you doing? Okay, calm down, calm down. I'll make you go sit down. All right, so that's, again, December 22nd. Um, if you want to help out with that. There's plenty of chances to do that. Come see me. Um, Family breakfast, December 2nd at 8 o'clock. Is that this Saturday? It is, right? Yeah, so if you want to be a part of our family breakfast, come hang out and eat food with your whole family. Bring everybody. Um, That can just be you if you are just your family. Um, Come and enjoy it. It means church family, everybody, come and enjoy some food. You can bring food if you want to share it, or you can show up at 7.30-ish, 7.15, and help me cook. That would be great. Um, You can see me for more details on that. Uh, junior class survey, if you didn't get one last week, it's not in the bulletin this week, but it's beside the bulletin. There's a little quick survey about um, what your thoughts are on our uh, junior church potential here, if that's something you're interested in. If you don't have kids, even like, or just your opinion matters no matter who you are. So even if you don't have kids um, and you have thoughts on it, fill out the survey and hand it to me or put it in the box back there. We'll get it. We want all of your thoughts and feedback on that. Sound good? Okay, we're doing communion today, so if you haven't got a cup yet, now's a good chance to do that. Um, They're right there. And I think that's all the announcements I had, basically. That's it. It covers everything. Look at them all come up. Procrastinators, last minute. Here they come. Man, yeah. That's why I reminded you up here. That's the whole point of announcements, to to remind you why you don't know what's going on. (laughs) Usually they don't, like, this is throwing me off here. It's fine. Then you have to stare at the child in between the glass. It's great. All right, scripture reading is going to be Matthew chapter 22, starting in verse 34. And as you're turning, I'll remind you um, to join us in, um, if you're joining us with giving, that we have our box back there where I just mentioned to put the survey. It's also our tithe and offering box. You can put your tithe and offering in there, or you can give online in any way you want to do that. Can I go see Logan? (laughs) Matthew chapter 22, starting in verse 34. But when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. We'll continue worshiping with our songs. Good morning, church. Guess what we're doing for songs today? (laughs) It's after Thanksgiving, which means Christmas music. (laughs) Um, I was on for song selection this week, and the reason I picked the songs that I did is because I wanted to 
reflect on the coming Messiah, kind of kicking things off. We're starting off with O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, which is one of my favorite hymns, not just because it's very pretty and very old and very Latin, but also um, because each of the verses reflects back on a prophecy about the Messiah. And there's a big, you know, the beginning comes in, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, which means God with us, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lowly exile until the Son of God appear. And this reflects back on that time between the Old and New Testaments in particular, where Israel is not the nation it once was. It was taken over by, you know, Babylon and then successively ruled by others. And there's a period of about 400 years where there is no communication from God by prophets that we're aware of. So this is, this is a sad and a difficult time for Israel. And in a sense, we connect with that as well because we're waiting for the second coming of Christ. And so I think we can connect with this not just in a historical perspective, but in a perspective of we also wait for God to be with us again. Um, so let's stand. <coughs> We're going to start a cappella, like good monks would do. <laughs> oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel, that mourns in lonely
Self? Okay, no, I didn't. All right, good. I just want to make sure it wasn't on my end. Um, and I ask the elders to come up as we're going to partake in our communion service. But I, I want to remind you of what you just sung. We sung about Emmanuel, which means God with us, God dwelling with us. And what we celebrate with Christmas is Christ coming to dwell amongst men. But Christ came and then he went back to be with the Father. But we recognize that there is a day yet to come when Christ will return again and when he will again dwell on this earth and end suffering and pain and we will truly find that he is the prince of all peace. This morning I want to read for you Psalms 118 in reflection of a holiday that just passed us this week. Verses 28 and 29 says, You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. In light of Thanksgiving season, as we approach communion this morning, I wanted to do so from a heart of gratefulness. We have so much in Christ to be thankful for. And I don't want you to raise your hands this morning, but I have to ask you some questions. How many of you have had something to eat today? How many of you were kept fairly warm last night? How many of you were well enough to get here today? How many of you had maybe some hot water this morning? How many of you had clean water? How many of you are free to be here today without fear of your safety? How many of you are here about reminded by the spiritual realities we just sang about with Christ coming to dwell. The Christ who bore our pain, who took away our disgrace, who gave us life, who crushed the curse of sin, who clothed us in righteousness, and who wrote the law of grace and righteousness with power upon us, who walks beside us, who makes our weaknesses become strength, who causes fear to flee, who sustains with his grace and love, and I could go on, and perhaps I should. We have much to be thankful for. And everything about what we gather for today is to be thankful for what Christ has done in the past to free us. And that is what communion is. It is a reminder, it is a memory of that which Christ has done for us individually and us corporately. First Chronicles 16.8 says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. As we come to communion, we remember the fact that Christ has made a sacrifice and that is something he has done for you and for I. This morning, I'd like you to take some time and reflect on how grateful we should be for all of the blessings, even the material blessings that he has given each of us, but more so the spiritual blessings that we have in Christ. Take some time this morning. Let's reflect on that as we listen to some music.
Paul, would you pray a prayer of thanks for communion? Father, we're reminded this morning of all good things that come from you. We thank you that you have um, brought us here this morning, you made it possible for us to be here. And Father, as we now partake in this communion service, Father, we, we're thankful for your son who went to the cross and shed his blood for the, to pay for our sins. Lord, we thank you that we can live with your spirit in us and, and enjoy life with you in, in eternity. Um, Father, we thank you for all good things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jesus, in Luke chapter 22, verse 19, he institutes the Lord's Supper with these words. He says, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. As we take the bread this morning, we remember it is his body that was broken. Let us eat. Likewise, after he had broken the bread and given it to his disciples, he took the cup. And he said, this is, my body, this is the cup that is poured out for you. This is the new covenant in my blood. Let us take the cup together today, remembering in thanks the sacrifice of Jesus' lifeblood that he gave so that we might have life. And not just, not just good enough life, but life abundantly. Let's take the cup. This is a promise of a covenant that is to be continued where Christ comes and he returns and he dwells with us, Emmanuel, once again, restoring all things. Let us look forward to that time as we celebrate his first coming through song. Stand up.
Amen. Have a seat, church. Good morning again. I find myself, as I, as I listen to that song and think about that song, that I often don't wonder enough as I wander around my life about what that really means for the Son of God, the creator of the universe, to come in the form of a helpless infant. And I'm excited as we get into the Christmas season and in the, in the coming weeks. We've got a couple more weeks in Romans. We're going to take a quick break from Romans uh, to, to address some, some Christmas-related topics. Um, but I'm excited to talk about our Savior who not only is God of all creation, but he's also a God who entered his creation so that he might save me, that he might save you. Um, that's pretty awesome. Um, we're going to be looking at Romans chapter um, 13 this morning, uh, and we're picking up from where Paul left off last week, um, and we're going to uh, just back up just a little bit to kind of get a, some context. Um, again, you know, I, I find it impressive that um, when this letter was probably given to the Romans, it was probably read in one sitting. Um, and I don't know about you, but if you've ever sat down and read the book of Romans, when I, the whole book at one time, um, when we were in college, I took Romans as a Bible college class, and the requirement was to read Romans three times all the way through. Uh, at the beginning of the semester, your, your, your first thing you had to do is you had to three different times sit down, plot out however much time it would take, and read the entire book all the way through. Uh, and it, it's, a, it's, it's a lot to undertake when you're reading the whole book. Now, granted, for you, those of you who like to read, um, it, that's no problem at all because, you know, it doesn't take very long. Uh, but the reality is, is that there's a lot in it. And I can't imagine the first time hearing everything that's being said in the book of Romans, you're like, whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. <laughs> Can you read that part again? <laughs> uh, no, no, we're going to get through the whole letter and then we'll, we'll go back to it. And, and that's why it was continually used because they recognized that the Spirit inspired the writing of Paul here uh, to not only just be a letter from Paul, but also to be a letter from God to the church. Uh, and so this morning, we're going to be picking up in Romans chapter 13. And I'll be honest with you, I was joking with Paul this morning, and I said, uh, would you care to preach that message again? Because I think I still need to hear it some more. Um, because I'll tell you, there, there's some hard things in Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through, 1 through uh, 7. Um, concerning the government. And sometimes I think we struggle because uh, for different reasons, uh, we might not like a particular government or a particular individual in government, or we may not particularly agree uh, on, on either a party or even looking at some of the more wicked governments in the world around us. Um, that Romans 13 applies not only in an American context, but it applies in the Soviet Union. It, it applies in all of these different horrible governments that there is an element to which Christians have to submit to the authority of Scripture and do so to submit to the authorities that are in the government in whatever society they're in. And that is a hard thing to do. And frankly, as an American, it's a lot easier thing to do for me because uh, I have at least a chance to vote. In Paul's day, they had no chance to vote. They had no chance to have their voice heard in government. They were just, this is, this is the guy. And probably at the writing of this is probably, Nero is probably the guy who's in charge. If you know anything about Emperor Nero, uh, he uh, liked to use Christians to light up his gardens at night. Um, so uh, not a very nice guy, um, but he's the kind of guy who Paul would eventually say we need to submit to. Um, starting in verse 7, um, Paul is kind of concluding the submission to authorities, and that's where we're going to pick up. I'm going to read verses 7 to 10 uh, of Romans chapter 13, 
And uh, we're going to come back because it, Paul ties all of this together. And I, and I don't want to lose that tie by starting in verse 8. So verse 7 says, Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Verse 8, Owe no one anything except to love, one, love each other. For the one who loves has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. So the conclusion of Paul's message last week, he addressed verse 7. Uh, and in a society that we live in, which is full of ways that you try to evade taxes, uh, in, in, a, in a way that we can try to squeeze out any possible free thing you can, uh, giving our, our respect and our honor only to those that we deem have earned it. Uh, we, we in America, we, we have this kind of context of, I'm going to pay as least tax as I possibly can. I'm going to find any way I can to get out of paying my taxes. Uh, and I will underreport revenue if I have to. Um, and we'll do the whole under the table thing. Um, and, um, I, you know, beyond that, also on top of that, you know, I'm not going to do that. But then I don't have to respect people if I don't want to. If they haven't earned my respect, they don't get my respect. That is an American mindset. That, you know what, you want my respect, earn it. Well, that's not what the scripture says. The scripture says the respect to whom respect is owed and honor to whom honor is owed. There is an element to which God has ordained certain authorities and they are owed certain things. And so we are, are not to push back against that. We are to respect. Now, that doesn't mean you have to agree Right? This doesn't mean that you have to be on board with everything they're doing. doesn't mean that you always have to like the person that's in authority. Um, th that's not what that's saying. What that is saying, though, is that ultimately we are to respect them, we're to honor them, we're to submit to them as the authority that God has set up, and we are to honor them as we are. We are to, as Christians, we're called to stand against our culture in the areas that go against what Scripture teaches. And oftentimes, I, I, like, I like to hear people say, I'm willing to die for what I believe in, but I'm not willing to follow what it says. And I think oftentimes people that say, I'm willing to die for what I believe in, maybe that might change when they actually are in a situation where they have to. Um, but it's very easy to get lift service for, I'll die for my faith, but you won't live for it. And here is in Romans chapter 12 and verse, in, in chapter 13, we're getting into the, how do you live for your faith? And it's not easy, guys. This is tough stuff. If we as Christians, if we do everything that we agree with Scripture on, that's not being obedient. And that's what Paul is addressing here is that you're going to, there's going to be situations where it's a, it's a hard struggle. You know, it's very hard for me to sometimes respect someone in authority over me when I feel like they're doing a poor job or when I, when I don't like them. Or when they treat me poorly. Um, but the reality, Paul says, is that I owe them what God has granted them. And that's how it's viewed right here in verse 7. And this is important to understand because as we come into verse 8, there, there's going to be more understanding of this ode. Now, I want to, I want to tell you something. So growing, growing up, you know, I was kind of that traditional, like, I don't want to give respect to anyone that doesn't earn it. And when I went to college... Uh, we had a security team in college, uh, and um, at one point along the time, in the time I was in college, I think it was my sophomore year, um, the uh, head of the security team, they were all hired students, but there was a head that was a paid, paid person on staff at the school, and he said, look, and he did a chapel message, and he said, the security here on campus is all about respect. It's all about respect. And... Reflecting on that after thinking about this passage, he is absolutely right. Because at that campus, we did not carry any guns. We didn't carry any tasers. Nobody was going to force their authority upon you in any sort of way where they were going to cause you harm. And as Christians, we were responsible to respect the authority and the security that the school had set up. That we owed those security officials respect. And I'll tell you, there was a couple of students that were on the security team I did not like. 
and they and they kind of edged at you, and they would they would intentionally try to use, and, and they were constantly being told not to do that, but but they would they would kind of edge at you a little bit and try to you know get you, get under your skin, and I remember going, I will not respect them because they haven't earned my respect. And as I think about this passage, what, what Paul is is saying here is that we respect those who God has set up over us because we owe them that respect because God has set them over us. And I, and I reflect back on, on what that chapel speaker, the head of security, was saying is it's all about respect. And in Christian circles, the reality is, is yes, it is all about respect. And it's about respecting those authorities, not always obeying them, because we, we see, as Paul mentioned last week in, in the scriptures, there are times where we have to go against the authorities. And there are times when those authorities are violating scripture, and we say, no, not, not here. Yet we do it in respect. So the idea that the, the Apostle Paul concludes with here is, is we're, we're to evaluate the relationships with different individuals and entities in your life and pay them what is owed to them or what's expected. And that's what we see in the end of verse 7 is he, he kind of says to all who is pay to all what is owed to them. If you owe something to someone, you pay it to them. And he lists some examples like taxes, revenue, respect, and honor. He keys into that idea as we come into chapter 13, verse 8. And I'm going to read verse 8 again. He says, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. So from his advice regarding governing authorities, Paul continues the idea of obligation. Do you see that? continues the idea of obligation. And it, he sets it to the exhortation of the neighbor, and he says, owe no one anything except to love one another or each other. Now, the first part I want to key in on is, is in verse 8, in the very beginning before my little comma, it says, owe no one anything. Now, I, I think that we we can go all sorts of directions with this, and, and I, I want to be careful this morning. But there is an element to which Christians should be very cautious in whom they get into indebted relationships with. Christians should be very cautious about who they get into indebted relationships with. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 22 and 23, Paul writes, For he who is called in the Lord as a bondservant is a free man of the Lord. Likewise, who is free when called is a bondservant of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. Paul says, in your life, do not seek to become a bondservant of another man, because if so, you'll be bound to his will, and you won't be bound to your master in heaven only. And there is another passage in the same text, the very next verse, it says, so brothers, whatever condition each was called, let him remain with God. He's, he's not saying if you're a, a slave, which many of the Christians, early Christians were, he's not saying, well, you know, tough luck, you can't serve your master Christ because you're a slave. That's not what he's saying. But he's saying is that you should seek your freedom. You should seek to pay your debts. And oftentimes in Roman society, you became a slave because you, you incurred some sort of debt um, for things that you needed. And Paul's saying, so as far as you possibly can, owe nothing to no one. Because then they can't make any demands upon you. That then, as a Christian, you were obligated to fulfill. And I want to be careful here, as many of us and many people have taken this verse to mean that we should never take on any debt whatsoever. And I don't believe that's consistent with the entire teaching of Scripture. Uh, I do believe that, as Solomon points out in Proverbs 22, 7, that the rich rules over the poor and the borrower is a slave to the lender. I think it's true that ultimately if you do decide to take on some sort of debt, that it's to a certain extent, you are a slave to that person that you have borrowed from. However, we do need to be really careful in how we borrow and how we go into debt with an individual or an entity as to, we ultimately do become beholden to that individual or that entity uh, for that amount or that debt. Now, I think when we look through all, all of Scripture, there's all sorts of provisions for borrowing, for debts, for all of these things. So there's an element to which in practice of life sometimes that doesn't work. And, and so the reality is, is that God has allowed provisions in that. In fact, even within the Mosaic law, he allowed a provision for the releasing of those debts at some point along the, in time. And so we recognize that God is not saying never take on any debt. 
Uh, and so I think you know there are some who have who have placed that burden on people. You can't buy a home until you have you know all two hundred thousand dollars saved up in your bank account. I, I, I think that's unreasonable. I, I don't think that's something that we can expect people. If you can, praise God. Uh, but I think there's an expectation there that it's wise debt, and we're recognizing when I do take on debt, and when I do owe something to somebody, I am taking on an obligation, and I have to ask myself, is this obligation going to prevent me from fulfilling my obligation to Christ? And I think that may take into effect when we go, well, what kind of a home can I afford? Right? Or what kind of thing can I afford? I think even cars nowadays, you know, a lot of times you've got to take out a loan on a car because they're expensive. I was looking at a new one recently, and I was like, man, like, this, is, this is not cheap. Um, and they went up in the last couple of years. I feel like the same car would have been a lot cheaper a couple of years ago. And I'm like, I guess I'm holding on to mine. Uh, you know, so uh, there's this idea, I think, that you know, we're, we may have to enter into debt relationships for some things. But we want to be mindful about what we are doing. And when we are entering into those debt relationships, what is our obligation to them? Because we want to be the kind of people who are free free to serve Christ, and that we own no one anything. So I think, I think about this specifically in Christian America, and I, I might step on some toes here, and, and please hear this. That if I do step on your toes, please talk to me, because uh, I want to hear from you. But I think that in some situations, this is true. In Christian America, oftentimes we enter into obligations that prevent us from being present among other believers on a Sunday morning, or even prevent us from sacrificing time in prayer or reading in scriptures so that we might work to pay off what we have borrowed. And, and that's not to say that, look, uh, there are all sorts of circumstances where, look, I got to have a job. They tell me I have to show up on Sunday. I, I got to work. I get that. I get that. But I think of the situations where I could take a, a less paying job, right, maybe, and maybe have less and still be okay and providing for my family and be able to be there and be a part. And not because everyone needs to sit in a seat on Sunday morning, but it's about connecting and being a part of the church. And if you aren't doing that, you're not fulfilling your requirements before Christ to gather together, to be assembled, to meet with one another. And that's not just supposed to be just on Sunday morning. Now, I, I'm not saying that you cannot work on Sundays. I'm not saying you can't miss church events. Please, that's not what I'm saying at all. If you hear that, you're wrong. B because Timothy actually is very, Paul writes to Timothy, and he says this in 1 Timothy 5.8. He says, if anyone does not provide for his relatives, especially for the members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. The reality is, is there is an expectation that you will provide for your household, for the members of your family, and, and sometimes that means you have to make sacrifices and cuts, and that's hard. But we shouldn't be making those sacrifices and cuts in order to live a cushy life here and now because then our aim and our focus is off. And if my aim is to build up a great kingdom for me to retire in and sit in uh, the rest of my earthly life, then I miss the point of my life. So, church, be careful to owe no one anything and that is the standard that the apostle sets, and it makes it possible for us to properly be available to fully serve God without restraint or contrary obligation. Yet if you do make this commitment to anyone, you've not sinned, but pay what you owe. Romans 13, 7. Pay what you owe. The Christian must make every effort with all diligence to the paying of whatever we owe. If you have a debt, pay it. Don't let it sit. Well, they won't come collect it. No, pay it. That's your obligation. Paul then moves from verse 8, owe no one anything, to what I think is impressive and something that has been on my mind all week. He says, except to love one another. And I think it's very quick that we could just pass over that and go, okay, yep, good. Well, we got to love people. All right, next but here, listen to what he's saying. He's saying, don't owe anyone anything except for owe them love. Owe them love. Paul is going to spend the rest of this brief section explaining this further, but what Paul's trying to draw our attention to is, is that if we're going to owe anything to anyone, we must remember the one thing that we've been commanded to do, and that is to love one another. 
before we dive into the full meaning of this and, and, and the obligation to love, I, I want to I notice one important fact. Christians are still sinners. They are those who should be struggling against the flesh in participation with the Spirit to do what is right. But we are still going to struggle with sin. I want you to turn over to 1 Peter chapter 1. Christians have been raised with Christ through baptism by faith. That's Romans chapter 5, verses, uh, chapter 5 and 6. We now have the power to fulfill the law, not so that we might receive our own righteousness, but that we might, so that we might earn heaven. That's what Romans 3.20 says. We cannot earn heaven by our own righteousness. But instead, that we might be faithful to what God has called us to, which is Romans chapter 8. First Peter, Peter t- talks about something very similar um, in context. We're going to look at chapter 1. Uh, we're going to look at verses 13 to 23. And what I want you to be mindful of is, is how similar, even though Peter and Paul are totally different guys, how similar the message is that Paul gives in chapter 12 and 13 to what Peter says in his writing his letter to the elect exiles of the dispersion. Starting in chapter 1, verse 13, Peter writes this, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that we brought to you at the revelation of Christ Jesus. Pause there just for a second. Peter commands the believers to firmly set their hope on the grace that is coming in Christ Jesus. That means he's saying, look, Christ is going to return. What we've been talking about this morning already through song and in communion, Christ is going to return, and we're not setting our hope on anything here. We're setting our hope on that. That's what we're going to set our hope on. And that is where our salvation is found. Verse 14, what does he say next? As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But he who called you is holy, so you also be holy in all of your conduct. Verse 16, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Here's what Peter's saying. He's saying, don't be conformed to the former passions of your former ignorance. Don't live like you did before Christ. Don't live like unbelievers do. Don't shape your behavior after your own personal desires or the desires of the world. Instead, you are to be holy in all of your conduct. You're to be set apart. You're to be different. Holiness is defined by the Lord of all creation, that God, God of God, live like God would live. Act like God would act. Why? Why do we do that? Verse 17 And you who call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Verse 18, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, but not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, that like a lamb without blemish or spot, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in these last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God who raised him from the dead and, give, and who gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Here, here's the reality. Here's the truth. The reason why we are to be holy, the reason why we are to act in the ways that we've been talking about in Romans chapter 12 and 13 is because God is holy and we are called to the standard of which God holds us to. Now, I, I think what's interesting here and, and sometimes that we forget about is that when we look at Romans, we get this clear picture that Christ has died to the law. We're to no longer follow after the law for our righteousness. And so there is this point to which you can almost come to the idea of, oh, well, okay, we can do whatever we want now, which Paul addresses in Romans chapter 6 and 7. But here's the thing. We are actually called to be holy. We're called to uphold the standard of the law. Not so that we might receive Christ and receive salvation and his righteousness. That's not why we do it. We do it in reflection of what he has already done for us. That's what Peter says. Peter says, remember that you've been bought with the blood of Christ, so don't live the way you did before. Live the way that you are to live now, not in the way of your former ignorance. Turn back to Romans chapter 13, verse 8. Because this is, this is key to what we're seeing in the Romans passage. In chapter 13, verse 8, he says, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. 
can I ask you, why does fulfilling the law matter? Didn't Christ fulfill the law? Then, then why is Paul asking the believers here, in a sense, to be held to fulfill the law? Do you see that? That's what he says. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. There's still this element to which Paul's saying, hey, you should live in light of the law. Now, what we come to recognize in the passage is he's talking about love. That's how he's going to define fulfilling the law is loving one another and loving your neighbor. Now, I can tell you that wearing two types of fabric this morning uh, has nothing to do with my love for you or my love you know, at all, which is why that kind of law, which exists in the Old Testament, is not reflected in what we see right here in the New. The reason why we're not concerned about the ceremonial practices of Israel found in the Old Testament is because right here, and Christ himself, which we'll look at shortly, he declares, love one another, love your neighbor. This fulfills the whole law. All of the law and the prophets are bore up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself and love God. And so when I think about those Old Testament moral laws, I should be seeking to uphold those as a believer, not for my righteousness, not for my salvation, but in order to live in the way that God would desire me to live in the communion with society around me. So the Christian is still expected to fulfill the moral law, not for salvation or righteousness, like I just said, but out of reverence and commitment to Christ. And out of that commitment to Christ, we fulfill the moral law in its ent entirety by following the principle that Paul reiterates from Jesus' own teaching, which is also the teaching of the Old Testament. So looking at verse 9, he says, For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covenant, you shall, or any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus is saying all of that, all of the moral commandments that you could possibly have thrown at you, just love your neighbor and you're not going to break them. What I find interesting is, is verse 8 going back. The obligation that Paul is declaring is that in addition to taxes, revenue, respect, and honor, we have an obligation to love one another obligation to love one another. We, as Americans, have a very much an attitude of, I don't owe you anything. <laughs> Get it yourself. Uh, that's unfortunately kind of our mentality. I don't know if that's because we, you know, broke off from England and we're like, you know, we got our own thing. I, I don't know. It, it, it's perpetuated in our society. It is like at the, at the core of who we are is that we're going to make something of ourselves, Right? And there is so much good in that, and it's produced so much good in our society, um, but there's also a lot of bad in that. And the reality is, is just because we have no king, no sovereign, no lord, and nobody that we bend the knee to, uh, we, as Christians, may recognize that we need to bow to the sovereign lord, but other than that, sometimes we're like, I don't owe anyone else anything. Yeah, that's not what the scriptures say. Um, they say, ultimately, right here, that we, me and you, we owe every single person love. We owe them love. Think on that. Romans 13, 8, owe no one anything except to love each other. Now, this verse isn't called for a superficial love for all people. We've already talked about that in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, that we are to sincerely love Right? Out of sincerity, not, not disingenuous, not two-faced. It's to be genuine love. Uh, at the same time, this doesn't necessarily mean that we are to have a personal affection for. Uh, because I'll tell you, there are certain people that I'm going to have a really hard time having a personal affection for, but I can act in love. I can act in their interest and away from my self-interest. And I think what's really a shame is that so often when we act in love, it, it, Jesus points this out so many times, you love people who love you. How easy is that? But how do you do with loving people that don't love you? When it's no longer self-full, when I'm no longer getting anything out of it, but I'm loving my neighbor, doing right by my neighbor, just because that's the right thing to do. That's what God has commanded me. I owe them that. 
I like how uh, a particular ancient writer puts it, Kerstanthum, I think he writes in the 500s. He interprets these words in this way. He says, we do not handle the debt of love in the way that we do taxes and tariffs, which we give when the time comes that it is due. Rather, we must immediately pay the debt of love and pay it without delay. And our Lord God does not want it to be paid off. And nevertheless, he always wants it to be paid, so that it is neither never entirely paid. Instead, we always remain in debt, for it is such a debt on account of the debt of love that we are always paying it, and nevertheless, the same time remain indebted. Here's what he's saying. Unlike taxes, once you've paid your taxes, you're good. Right? You're done. You paid it, you're done. Right? And then hopefully you get a refund at the end of the year because hopefully you paid too much. But with love, you're never done paying it. You don't write the check and say, okay, I paid the taxes, we're good. I don't have to do anything else until... The next time taxes come, do. Love is due every day, all the time, in every situation. You always owe it to the fullest measure. It's unlimited in its requirement. And you're never done paying it off. And it's something that you do for every single individual. Uh, I don't know about you, I'm convicted. Because I'm not like that. And this week, as I was interacting with some, some situations, I, I asked myself, I said, okay, um, I owe this person love. <laughs> so how do I respond? Um, because when I think about it that way, not that they might get my love if they're worth it, or they might get my love if I feel up to it, or they might get my love if, if I'm having a good day. Um, and I think of it instead as, no, I owe that person I'm responsible to pay that person love and kindness. Um, That's a whole different way of looking at it. Verse 9 and 10 is a summation of the law. It's a direct quotation from Leviticus 19.18, where Leviticus 19.18 says, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This is not a new commandment. This is not Jesus came up with this great idea of, Oh, you know what? We can just sum up all those laws and just say this, and it's great. He didn't come up with that. That was already there. Um, this, this was the intent all along. Um, the Pharisees had just lost the intent, which is exactly what we see in Matthew chapter 22. Let's turn over there. Uh, it's the last text I'll ask you to turn to this morning. Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 40. We've been doing the questions of Jesus in Sunday school, and if you are available in the morning before church, I would highly recommend it. It's a great discussion with a group of people and uh, just really breaking down the things that Jesus asks and the things that he says. Um, But um, looking at Matthew chapter 23, verse 34, we're right in the middle of the Sadducees, Pharisees. Everyone's trying to come after Jesus to try to trip him up. And verse 30, excuse me, verse 34 of chapter 22 reads this, but when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. Okay, they're, they're trying, to, trying to get him on something. And, they, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said this to him. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is likened to it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. These are the two things. To love God, to love your neighbor as yourself. Paul says that all of the exterior commands between each other in our relationships are all dependent ultimately on love for a neighbor. And all of the law and all of the prophets is summed up in loving God and loving neighbor. And obviously I don't need to encourage you that you owe God your love. Uh, He purchased you. I think that makes that pretty clear. But I think we struggle with the idea of owing our neighbor love. And now, th- this doesn't mean that you always have to give every single thing you have over to them. That's not what I'm saying. But this does mean that you do have an obligation to do right by them, to care for them enough to do what's right for them. And you know, sometimes that might mean your neighbor comes to you and says, I need this thing, and you have that thing, and you give them that thing, even when it's not easy. Jesus is being very clear in what he says in Matthew chapter 22 
And Paul is reemphasizing that in Romans chapter 13. And here's the call. Don't do wrong to your neighbor. Instead, think about how you can fulfill your obligation to them on behalf of Christ to love them. And that means action and doing things that are right towards them. So church, here's what the charge is going to be this morning. How can you live your life with your neighbors? And we all know the passage that talks about, well, who's my neighbor? That's everybody, okay? Everybody's your neighbor, okay? It doesn't mean just the neighbors, you know, right next door and everyone else is, you know, the person at Walmart, fair game, right? That's, that's not what that's saying, okay? This is everybody, all right? So the idea being is that how can I fulfill my obligation to this person to love them? How can I do that? Well, Paul doesn't stop stop there. In chapter 13, verse 11, we're going to finish up here with verses 11 to 14. He gives a little bit more of the reasons behind all of this. So in Romans chapter 13, verse 11, he, he reads, and I'm going to read this, and this is what he says. Besides this, you know the time, uh, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Paul basically sets up this entire scene with with two different kind of paradigms. The first is the nature of the time, which is in verse 11 and 12a. And the second is the actions in light of that time which is in verses 12b to 14. Paul starts off with verse 11, besides this, this is, this is the idea. He's, he's describing a further reason to live in the manner that he's describing. He's saying, if, if uh, what I said before, fulfilling the law is not important enough to you, one, that's a problem, but, but two, if you need another reason, here's the other reason. The reason is, is that you know the time. You know the time. And that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. Uh, this, this is the idea of being woke, okay? This is the original idea of being woke. <laughs> okay? Not in the modern version, okay? But, but the, the, the original version of being woke, hey, wake up. See what's going on around you and work to fix it in your life. Don't just continue in ignorance. Don't just continue to do the things that you did before you came to Christ. You owe love. Live in it. Now is the day. For salvation is nearer to us now than we first believed. That is true for every single person here. It was true for them then. It's true for us now. Because the reality is either Christ is going to return or you are going to die. Those are one of the two realities that you are going to face. Either Christ is going to return or you are going to die. And for those of you who think that Christ is going to return before you die, I pray, I pray that's true. And it's very possible. But, beloved, we have over 1,900 years of church history where believers have died. Do not think for one second that it would be wrong for God to allow you to experience death. Many have, more probably will. So you need, to re, you need to understand that fact. You need to not live like you did before. Live in reflection of his coming and live in reflection of your death. And with your death or with Christ's coming, either way, salvation is nearer. That's the point. That's the point. Paul says in verse 12, the night is far gone, the day is at hand. We, we no longer have to live in darkness because we now have the day, Christ shining in our hearts. He says, then let us cast off, verse 12b, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. If that sounds like Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 6 to you, that's because it is. 
It's the same exact kind of terminology. Paul expands upon that, I think, in Ephesians, when he writes to the Ephesians. And the idea ultimately behind this is a put off and a put on, a walk decently. And the, the idea of this put off or to cast off the works of darkness is to cause a state to cease by force with the implications of elimination, to remove or to drive out. That we are to exert some effort in the casting off the works of darkness because we are going to desire to gratify the desires of our flesh and that it's contrary to the will of God. And that's contrary to loving our neighbor. And that's contrary to fulfilling our obligation to love our neighbor. And Paul says to cast off those works, put on the armor of light, let us walk properly as in the daytime. Guess what doesn't happen in the daytime? Most of the time. There's always those exceptions that prove the rule. But the point is, is that there's this element that Paul recognizes even in his day. At nighttime, people are carousing. They're doing all sorts of stuff. And Paul's saying, don't live like people do in the nighttime. Live like people do in the daytime when people see them. Because the reality is, is we are people of the day and we recognize that God does see. And he will reward us on our behavior and our actions. Romans chapter 12. We talked about that already. And then he gives us some stipulations on what that looks like, not in orgies or drunkenness, not in sexual immorality or sensuality or quarreling or jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you're like, well, I don't think I struggle with any of those things. Well, great. Then look at verse 14. Make no provision for the flesh. Okay? Uh, wh what does this mean? Make no provision for the flesh. Well, here, here's the idea. Don't prepare to do something to gratify yourself. Don't in your mindset go, I'm going to go do this to satisfy me. There's, there's two different types of sins. There is the sin where it hits you like a ton of bricks in a situation and you make a really poor choice. And then there's this sin where you plan it. I know that when this situation comes up, here's what I'm going to do. When this person says this to me, I'm going to say this to them. When, when, when I, you know, it's time for Thanksgiving, I am going to eat so full that I'm a glutton. Too soon? But it, we laugh, but is it not true? Right? We, we have these seasons of, well, it's Christmas, so I can eat as many cookies as I want. I can be gluttonous in Christmas. I mean, we're celebrating Jesus and the fact that he sacrificed everything, so I'm going to fill myself. <laughs> I, I mean, brothers and sisters, it doesn't make sense. We are to make no provision. That is to think about something ahead of time with the implication that we can then respond appropriately. We are to give attention, and we are not to give attention to doing our sin. We're not to, to give attention to meeting our own selfish and selfish and sinful desires. We are to instead make provision to do what is right. We are to, out of obligation for our brothers and sisters and even the person down the road that we don't like or can't stand, to owe them love and to give them love. This is the core of what we see in Romans 13, finalizing this text. It starts with the authorities, moves into every single person, that we owe them something. I want to leave you with this quote. Christians are not only to become what we are, we are also to become what we will one day be. I'm going to read that again. We are not only to become what we are, we are also to become what we one day will be. That is the charge. It's not an easy charge, but it's a charge that we can accomplish by the power of God through His Spirit. Let's pray. Father God, I am... I am completely incapable of preaching this message as I, as I reflect on my week and I reflect on the times that I, that I satisfy my own desire rather than what is right, what is loving to neighbor. Father, what's oftentimes loving to my spouse. Father, I pray that you would forgive me 
Forgive me for the times that I willfully choose to do wrong. That I don't think ahead of time and prepare to do what is right. God, I pray that you would instill in our church the understanding that we owe others love. Not because they deserve it, but because you have given us love when we didn't deserve it. We owe them the same. Father, I pray that we would fulfill your moral law, not out of duty or obligation or fear of punishment, but that we would do so out of the kindness and mercy of Christ and his shedding of his blood for us, that in response to that, that we would exude love for you and exude love for those whom you have created. Father, I pray that you would impact our church with that by your spirit, that that would, res- would continue throughout this week, that we would continue to be reminded as we interact with that person who's difficult, uh, as, we, as we even interact with sometimes our kids that might be difficult, God, that we owe them love. And Father, might we remind of that and dwell on your strength and draw from your strength to accomplish the things that you set before us. And we ask these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Worship team. It can be easy to think we're really good people until we come up to what it actually means to love somebody unconditionally and putting other people before ourselves. But if you're feeling kind of like, wow, I'm undone and not very successful at this, you're in the right camp. So I'll come, all you unfaithful, and let's come and sing about a God who gives us what we need when we're guilty and have nothing else to show for it. So let's stand and sing.
you so much for the message that you had for us today. Um, Lord, may we just go forward today um, embracing those teachings that we would not just keep them as head knowledge, but that we would put it into practice to be mindful um, when to um, yield to the Holy Spirit if we are acting unloving, that we would love not even out of just obligation, but um, out of joy, because that is what you called us to do and to um, love one another abundantly to go above and beyond. Lord God, I just pray that um, as we go out, um, that we would uh, just be doers of your word and to um, put it all into practice. And um, we just thank you so much for bringing us together as the body to worship you each week. And we um, pray for healing for anybody who is not able to join us today and those at home. Um, Lord, we just thank you for all of the body, and it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. I'm like, okay, cool.